to the all new, all different number one comics podcast where each week Bob and I say hello, Bob. Hi, Bob. (laughs) Take a deep dive into a brand new number one comic book that shows up at your local comic book shops as well as virtually. Yes. To get us started this week, we are going to talk a little bit of comic book and related media news. We're also going to talk about some new comic books that are at shops this week, as well as our deep dive into... Bob, what book are we covering this week? This week we're covering from the Archie Horror imprint, (laughs) Betty, the Final Girl, number one. Yeah, we finally got Archie in there. I'm super excited. Although, spoiler alert, we don't see much of Archie in this issue. No. Or any, really. But we hear Jughead's name once. (laughs) Yeah, that's about it. That takes us to our first ad break, and we'll be right back. We are back with some news. Again, same as the last couple of weeks, pretty light on news this week. I didn't see a whole lot out there. As far as news that we're going to talk about, there were a couple of announcements from Amazon. I know um, you and I talked about one, Bob. There's going to be an animated Witches series. Yes. Which sounds really cool. That book is great. It's actually scary as hell. There's not too many comics I can think of that kind of scared the shit out of me when reading them. But that is definitely one. That is a dark, dark, scary book. I'm interested to see it in animation instead of live action. I can't say that I'm necessarily disappointed it's not going to be live action, but I don't know. I I would have loved to see what they could have done with live action. Would something like that lend itself to live action, though? I feel like there's a way. I mean, look, you said this past week that you finally, finally got up on The Last of Us and are watching that, um, I would feel like something like The Last of Us would would be hard to conceive in in live action. Um, Of course, the video game is like, you know, pretty photorealistic or whatever, but but to have the... um, I don't know, the creatures of the world, the, they're not zombies, but whatever, the, the infected. The clickers. Yeah. Well, I, I think just their general term is supposed to be right. the infected. But but to think about some of them with, like, the fungus growing on their heads and everything like that um, in live action with practical and, and CG effects, like, that seems kind of hard to do. So, I, I, I don't know. I would assume you could do witches for sure in, in live action, but it's just not going to materialize that way. Maybe for budget reasons. I don't know. I actually have no concept of, of budgetary reasons for whether something goes to live action or animated. I don't know which one costs more and which one costs less. Well, Amazon so far seems to be willing to pump money into their properties, so that's definitely a plus. Yeah, that's that's right. I, I am excited about that. My, my excitement level is pretty up there. Again, that's a really good book. I suggest anybody read that. Um, it's a little, like I said, it's a little scary, but <laughs> if you're okay with that, um, definitely, definitely check out Witches. And then we're we're also getting a live action Spider Man Noir. I, I was waiting for your thoughts on that. That's I don't know exactly how I feel about that. It may be too dark, literally, <laughs> just because Spider-Man Noir. I mean, if if done right, it could be like one of the, uh, you know, serials from back in the day just brought to the big screen. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about it, and I wasn't at first until I really thought about it. Of course, it's going to take place, what, in the 30s, I think, something like that, 20s yes. or 30s. And then I feel, you know, we're going to get that dark uh that gray tone color palette the dark black and white uh, almost like a black and white dick tracy yeah exactly and then i don't know i'm just getting i'm i'm just getting this feel uh (laughs) i i don't know um maybe it'll be great i'm i'm kind of excited about it It depends on who's gonna play the character depends on who the sporting cast is all of that of course here's hoping for nicholas cage oh that would be great but i highly doubt he'll head a show at amazon that would be cool though (laughs) Yeah, Nicholas Cage. Yeah, I could, I could definitely, I could definitely take that. You might need the money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Next up, 
a small bit of news. I, I mentioned this to you just through a text. Um, I don't even know how familiar you are with the character if you were into reading Valiant or not. I was a huge, huge Valiant kid. I loved Valiant in the 90s. Loved Harbinger. That's always been my jam. One of the first, I, I think Harbinger and New Mutants, one of the first series that I collected fully and have, you know, issues one through whatever, zero through whatever, all that. But we're getting a Faith series, or a Faith solo film. Faith, uh, so I, judging by the blank expression on your face. I know nothing. Nothing. Okay. Well, look, Faith is a really cool, valiant character. Again, it's going to depend on casting. It's going to depend on writing. There's, there's too much it will depend on. I'm trying to think back now, and I can't even think, because we got that one Valiant movie a couple of years ago, and it didn't do well, and I can't think at all what Valiant property that was. So the the film we, we were talking about was a Bloodshot movie. Yes. <laughs> that you did see. I, I didn't see that movie. You, you said it wasn't your favorite. It definitely... Was a movie. It was watchable. <laughs> a friend and I watched it, um, not in theaters, mind you. Sure. We watched it when it came to um, one of the, you know, pay X amount for this movie, PlayStation Store, whatever you want to call it. Oh, okay. And it was a watchable movie. It definitely wasn't great. I mean, it was definitely because of the character CGI heavy. Yeah, sure. And all I can say is it was it was there. It wasn't anything really remarkable, which is why I could not, for the life of me, remember the, the title of the movie. <laughs> or that it existed. Until oh. you said Vin Diesel a few years ago, <laughs> then it's kind of like, oh yeah, Bloodshot. Well, look, I will say this, as, as sad as that sounds, at least they accomplished more than DC did with the Batman movie, because you just said it was watchable, so... Uh, <laughs> I might that, have to dig that one up and, and that see. Is, that is true, <laughs> considering you've tried to watch the Batman six different yeah. times oh, and God. haven't been able to, haven't been able to get, get through it yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I just give up. I, I don't think I care anymore. <laughs> if if I didn't state that before, that's my stance now that I'm going by. Anyways, Faith is like I said, first appeared in Harbinger, I think around ninety ninety two. Harbinger number one, January ninety two, Valiant Comics. Uh, created by Jim Shooter and, and Dave Lapham and, and, and all of those people. Faith is... It's interesting for Faith to have a solo movie. I'm not sure exactly how to feel about that. I don't know. Especially, we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about how superhero movie fatigue and stuff like that was out there. So, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how they're going to... I don't know. Just it's It seems interesting to choose faith. It, it seems like right now you would want to choose your less superhero-y properties, your horror stuff, your, I don't know, war stuff. There, There's a lot to choose from other other than superhero, and we're choosing superhero from a, a lower-tier publisher. So, so I don't know. Sounds interesting. I, I want to talk about a couple of trailers that did come out yes. since, since last week. We had a Flash trailer, of course. We mm -hmm. had... Another Guardians 3 trailer. Um, we both watched both of those trailers. Let's talk about the Flash one first for a second. We're not going to break it down or anything. We don't have it right in front of us. I didn't make notes of it or anything, but just thoughts. Uh, I'm Again, I hate to sound like this person, but I've been burnt by T DC way too many times. It looks okay. I'm going to throw that out there right from the beginning. It looks okay in my expectation of DC movies. Aquaman, uh, what else? Wonder Woman, I don't, Dawn of Justice. All, the, these trailers looked better to me than the Flash trailer, and the movies were horrible. So, I don't know. What are you thinking? Well, and you talk about the trailers, and, you know, I must say, and this has become problem with even marvel movies mm -hmm. trailers you know you can get a sense of the entire movie just through the through the trailer you know they put the best parts in yeah. where you get to the movie and it's kind of like yeah you see those parts 
And then you see parts where it's like, this is a boring movie. I got, I got scammed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wait a second. You mean that this movie is more than just what was in that two and a half minute trailer? There's scenes of people talking and sitting around and having lunch with one another. Well, that's boring as hell. I don't, I don't want to watch that. And then, of <laughs> course, with pretty much every trailer, sometimes you're not even guaranteed to see what you saw in the trailer. Yeah, well... Look, that's that's another big story there. Of course, there's lawsuits out there for... Oh, yeah. I, I can't think of what movie it is, but there there was a movie where the audience wanted to sue because one of the actresses that was in the trailer didn't end up in the film, and that's actually gone to court. I don't think it's been ruled yet, but but the lawsuit is, is, is going forward. A judge is allowing it or something. So, so yeah... I, I don't know that that could that could go a number of different ways with the way that these production companies make their trailers now, which I, I don't know. I think that's kind of stupid. It's just another form of art, so you can kind of do whatever the hell you want with it. But whatever. But but yeah, you're right. There's so much in this trailer. I can't imagine there's going to be much left for us to see in the movie. Look, it's a trailer, so we're going to go ahead and spoil whatever <laughs> in it. But you've got Michael Keaton. You've got Batflick in there. Like. Why are we getting these huge drops in a trailer? Like, why would you not wait till you see the movie for that to happen? All they needed to stop on was that shot of Michael Keaton turning around <laughs> in the cowl, yeah. and they could have stopped the trailer right there. Sure. Um, so, so this is going to be a big event, of course. Of course, so many people are going to want to see this and, and want it to be good because of Michael Keaton. And again, we already knew that. Michael Keaton and, and Ben Affleck and 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 company were going to be in it, but the problem here is like, what are they going to do now with the movie? Is the movie going to hold up that good to where it's still interesting to go see? And it's not just because you wanted to see Michael Keaton back in the Batman costume because you want to see his Batcave with with a waterfall. I, why is there a waterfall in his Batcave? I don't know, but uh, maybe they'll explain that in the movie. But because he's rich and he can afford it. Sure. I, I guess it's been plenty of time, so he can install a waterfall. <laughs> Why not? But, Feng Shui. Yeah, sure. It's just, I don't know. It, it felt like it was giving a lot away. It seems like it has these really, really big ideas. And again, I'm sorry to say this. I know I sound like a DC hater, but it just, it doesn't look like it's going to work. It looks like they're throwing way too much out there without building up any of the universe first. And I think that's the reason why it worked for Marvel because it was this, this organic movie by movie thing to build up this universe. And DC again thinks that they can just do it all in one movie. Again, that's, that's what they did before and that's what didn't work. Let's just throw everybody together in a movie. There we have our expanded universe. It works, whatever. It still doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. Why is, I mean, I can't say it doesn't make sense because I haven't seen it yet. Maybe it will make sense. But why do we have Ben Affleck? Why do we have Michael Keaton? Why do we have Robert Pattinson on another random planet? Why do we have a singing Joker on another random planet? What is going on here? This is like a cluster. Well, and I don't know um, I don't know what you felt, but I'm kind of wondering, are they going to have Christian Bale cameo in this movie too? I'm, I'm all... Honestly, scared that everyone's going to be in this movie. I'm scared that we're going to see Christian Bale, then we're going to see Robert Pattinson, then we're going to see, uh, I don't know, a, I don't know, <laughs> a CGI Adam West. I, I don't know. I just feel like everybody's going to be in here, and then the animated Batman's going to walk onto the screen. Like, it just seems like, yeah, what, what are they doing? It seems like Flash is going to, okay, regardless, Flash is going to be like the side thing. Like, it's all going to be about Batman again, because that's, oh, yeah. that's all we can focus on in DC is Batman. Everything has to be about Batman. This was supposed to be a Flash movie, I think. <laughs> um, and I get that it's a Flashpoint thing and, and, and all of that. Well, yeah, but Black Adam was supposed to be a Black Adam movie. But yeah, it's... I, I don't know. It was just, a movie with Black Adam in it. Yeah, I'm just not feeling this. It looks cool. I, I can't say... I, I think just in concept, I'm not feeling it. It does look great. Ezra Miller, of course, is, is good as The Flash... Uh, Michael Keaton is great as Batman, and, and so was Ben Affleck, so I don't know. See, and you brought him up. I'm wondering if this movie is going to suffer just because Ezra Miller is in it, and people won't see it because of Ezra Miller. 
I wondered that too. I don't see a whole lot of backlash online or anything just yet. Maybe that will translate better to attendance, you know, from the audience. So we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll definitely have to see about that. Ezra Miller, <clears throat> notorious for, for doing some shysty shit. And I don't know. Uh, look, James Gunn is out there promoting this. He's he's already, I think, tweeted or said somewhere or whatever, publicly said that he's in love with this movie. It's great, whatever. I don't know. Uh, I would expect that he's, you know, kind of has to say that. He's in charge of DC. Now he's the head of DC, the co-head of DC with some other guy that we didn't even know his name. So, um, so I don't know. I hope it's good. That's, that's all I can say. That's all I can say for any comic book project or, or anything. I hope that it's good, but this is interesting. There was, an, there was one piece of DC, uh, movie news that I wanted to interject with. Well, not Please. really movie news, but streaming news, but apparently the justice league dark movie or TV series, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. TV series has been scrapped uh, for right now, which is very disappointing yeah. because I've seen a couple of animated, you know, uh, series from mm-hmm. uh, DC movies uh, with just Lee Dark in it, and those characters are really interesting. Yeah, that really sucks. I'm I'm kind of sad that we're not going to see that anytime soon, but. Maybe it's for the better. Maybe maybe it's for the better that it takes a back seat and then comes back up whenever DC has a little bit more figured out. I'm just I'm just tired of acting like every single time that that DC comes out with a movie that everything's figured out and it just doesn't really seem like it is. So they really didn't do too much with JJ Abrams while they had him. Sure. Now in other news, of of course we'll get to this Guardians 3 trailer in a second. I did talk about that, but kind of like we were talking how how everybody's on DC's high horse right now because of James Gunn and mm-hmm. his announced slate of movies and, and, and everything. There has been a lot of public distaste for, for Marvel lately. A lot of people are saying they're they're definitely fatigued, they're tired of the Marvel machine, it's just a machine, blah blah blah. They have a formula. Uh the early reviews for Ant Man and Wasp Quantumania have come out and, and basically people are saying like, I I can't say negative, but pretty like lukewarm things about it. It's, it's definitely being hailed as like, okay, this is kind of Marvel needs to put themselves in check and, and rethink what they're doing. And then Kevin Feige did come out and say that, you know, everything will slow down. Now the, um, the Disney plus shows will, will be a lot less and everything. I'm just interested in this because, again, I, I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, of course. I've, I've enjoyed everything I've watched Marvel-related. There is not a thing other than... It did take me a couple of times to get through Eternals. I can't lie about that. It took well, me... Well, it probably took a lot of people <laughs> a couple of times to get through Eternals. Sure. I, I honestly, and I hate to admit this, I have not finished Shang-Chi. And I've heard it's a great movie, but I haven't finished it. I I started it one day and just never went back to it. So I could definitely see it not being the hugest deal in the entire world to me like it was at the beginning. But with that being said, I I watched every single Marvel show through and I loved them. Like actually waited week to week and could not wait for the next episodes to come out. Was not disappointed by anything that was put out there. While you have other people saying that Miss Marvel was terrible, that She-Hulk was like the worst thing they'd ever seen and all that, I loved both of those shows. I loved them. I loved Moon Knight. I thought it was amazing and insane. So I'm just not... I personally am not feeling what, what's getting put out there that this is too much. There's too much going on. It's too much to keep up with. I don't. I also don't feel like I have to keep up with it. I feel like it's something that I want to do, but I don't feel like it in, affects my enjoyment of the MCU movies, if I watched something like Miss Marvel or if I watched Moon Knight, it it had no effect on that whatsoever. Now, I could see the little bit of tie-in from WandaVision to Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness for sure. But other than that, I don't really see any correlation. Like, they're kind of standalone things. It's not like reading an event comic. It's like it's like the comics. Marvel is putting out, I don't know, let's say 75 issues, or sorry, separate series a month, and then 
Do I need to read Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur to understand what's going on in Daredevil? No, it has nothing to do with one another. But guess what? If I want to pick up Daredevil and I want to pick up uh, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur and I also want to pick up uh, Vision miniseries, I can, but they don't have anything to do with one another. Just like these movies and, and shows are doing. Like, yeah, they have crossover, of course, because they're characters in the same universe, but there's nothing saying I'm, I'm sitting here reading page 16 of Amazing Spider-Man and all of a sudden I have to stop and then go pick up Incredible Hulk 142. Like, it, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, to be, on, to be honest, Moon Knight did not have a whole lot of tie-in to the larger cinematic universe. Sure. I mean, we yeah. really didn't see any... I mean... Moon Knight would have been a perfect series to introduce a werewolf by night, but Absolutely. they decided not to do that mm -hmm. or, you know, go into more of the horror elements. I mean, yes, She-Hulk had a lot of, you know, tie into the larger Marvel Universe, but, I mean, that's the character of She-Hulk. Yeah. Mean, we're talking about a character that breaks the fourth wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but, I mean, and talking about the, you know, people are starting to sour saying Marvel's just a machine. I think you know, the biggest thing lately is Phase 4 was just a big disappointment. Yeah, sure. I mean, movie quality, I really can't say personally it was the best movie quality. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Love and Thunder, I mean, it was, it was just all over the place. Sure. So, I think that's... That is probably the biggest reason why people are going like, okay, Marvel needs to, you know, pull it back a little bit. Yeah, and uh, again, I have no... I just want these things out here, whether they're from DC, Marvel, Valiant, Image, whatever. I, I just want more media to consume because that's that's good for the creators. That's good for all of us. We that's that's what we're here for to, to watch and read stuff well yeah who doesn't want to see you know their favorite characters from books they love mm -hmm. on the big screen or the small screen yeah sure it's it's nice now whether this has a place like going forward for the general movie going audience i think is is the question have we hit a point where everyone was interested and now they're not now it's it's more for us I don't know, maybe. And is that a problem? I don't know. It's not a problem to me. Uh, this notoriously isn't for everybody. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I know you as well as me didn't go to elementary school and, and, and run in the door carrying a short box of comics and telling everybody that no. you were reading comic books. No. Uh, I mean, we grew up in the, in the 90s. People would have made fun of you. It wasn't that cool. So, yeah, now you can probably go to school and say you're reading comics or whatever, and, and that's more accepted. But when we grew up, it wasn't. So not to sound pretentious or whatever, but this is I don't, I'm fine if this is for us. I'm fine if they're making movie and TV shows for comic book fans and not only the general movie going audience. That's that's fine with me. I have no problem with that. You know, and a good friend of mine, he posed a question to me and another friend when we went to see oh, either Avengers Infinity War or Avengers Endgame. I can't remember exactly which one it was. Mm -hmm. But he posed a question to us that does it make you all kind of mad that just because in the movies you you have all these new you know comic book fans mm -hmm. just because of the movies and they've never read a comic in their life and it's kind of like I don't know how you would feel about it but you know my answer was kind of like no it doesn't because you know now people are finally starting to see you know what I love yeah sure and I, I completely agree with that. That is a, a very true statement. I want anybody who's interested in getting into comics to get into it. And whatever way that they have to get into that, whether it's through watching movies or, or word of mouth or going to a comic shop or, or whatever, 
I just want these things to continue, of course. That's that's the main goal, that we continue to get content out there. And how do you do that? By more people consuming it, of course. But I think that comics have been through a lot, of course. We know that. They've, they've been through so many things. They've gone through, you know, of course, being, you know, the Comic Code Authority. They've gone through... I don't know where they couldn't say a vampire. They, they there's there's been some, the counterculture of the '60s and '70s, the the extreme stuff going on in the '90s, and then like the bankruptcy of Marvel and and all of that. Back to the popularity of things like the Batman animated series, kind of bringing up certain things for DC, and then you know to to what it is now. Maybe back down to like a dip or whatever. I, comics will persevere. They've been through a lot. And they will continue to go through a lot. And that's always going to happen. I'm, I have no problem with that. I think that it's just, it's just interesting, I guess, for so many people to have a voice. And so many people to say they have superhero fatigue. They have fatigue with Marvel's machine and all of this. And, and again, I hate to sound like this because this isn't the right way to sound. But like, it wasn't for you in, in the first place, I guess. Like... Okay, I'm, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I'm glad that you hopped on Wikipedia to read about Thanos and, and you know a little bit before you went in to watch the movies, but <laughs> but we knew about these characters for like a long time. So I don't know, that sounds really rude, I guess. Like I, I shouldn't present it that way, but I guess I'm just saying, you know, for long-term comic fans, for, for collectors, for readers, I don't have any fatigue. Like I'd love to continue to see this stuff. And I think there's so many different corners that they can dip into that aren't just superhero. There's so much you can do with comics. There's every genre of comic is out there. There's, look, we have uh, NFL Super Pro, okay? You can do anything with comics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you should. That was a very 90s <laughs> idea. <laughs> you shouldn't, but, but you can. Yeah. But that is true. let me get off of that soapbox for a second and, and talk to you about the Guardians 3 trailer. This last or latest Guardians 3 trailer that dropped. Thoughts, notes, what do you have? This was a... Every one of these trailers for Guardians 3 so far has been pretty insane. I think that we know that the stakes are super, super high. Yes, and not everybody will make it out. Sure. I think we all have our thoughts and, and everything. And I think that also you can kind of see some Easter eggs as to what you might think are going on, whether they're like red herrings or, or actual, I don't know, but I don't know. What, what do you think? What, what are your thoughts on this latest trailer? I'm, you know, and I'm hoping they do it justice. Cause I mean, they're definitely, you know, going to counter earth and mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the U men. Um, I'm hoping it's done right. I mean, uh, you can't not love, like, the comic book accurate uniforms yes. that they're going to do in this one, which, you know, is a big plus with longtime Guardians fans. Mm -hmm. I just have high hopes for this movie in general. I mean, I can't say much more. Yeah, it's it looks great. This is looking really, really good. That's also another thing... Look, I, I don't want to always come in and, and be the the voice of... Uh, the, the voice the, of reason? Not not reason, but the dark voice that comes out with the negative... Uh, the DC and, voice. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yes. I'm Batman. But uh, no, I think that... Look, Guardians is a lot of fun. Guardians 1, great movie. I really enjoyed Guardians 2. Um, I really, really liked that holiday special. And I'm looking forward to this. I think that it's going to be really good. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Here's my hot take for the episode. Uh, the The Batman thing's not even a hot take anymore, so who cares about that So at this point? But my hot take for the episode is, yes, most people who didn't read comic books had no idea who the Guardians of the Galaxy were before the movie came out. Even some comic book fans who aren't, you know who are newer to the hobby or whatever, didn't know who Guardians were, sure. I get that. Guardians were made a household name after the movie. <clears throat> yes. James Gunn directed this, this, you know, he, he kind of brought it to the forefront, sure. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to go on a limb and say, Guardians is good, Guardians did good, whatever, because of the characters 
it has nothing to do with James Gunn. I, I hate to say it and I hate to bring it out there, but I just I'm just not sure how much of this is James Gunn and how much of it is is Marvel and and the writers that created these characters already presented this huge vast universe and they did so much in the pages of those comics. And I think that people forget to give credit to that is all that I'm saying. I don't think we can credit just James Gunn with with the success of Guardians. I think that the groundwork was already laid there. Those are some great stories in the comics that are really overlooked, is all I'm saying. So I will, uh, once again, jump off of my soapbox and just talk about the trailer. But yeah, I this trailer looks really, really good. It looks really interesting. It looks like... Looks like Bob's going to be crying by the end of this movie. and uh, <laughs> I'll bring tissues yes, to the theater. Please do. Uh, but yeah, it's it's looking great, and I'm really, really excited about it. I I honestly don't know what else to say about it. I'm just I'm excited, and I'm sad that this is most likely going to be the last Guardians movie that we get. I would assume the way the dominoes are falling now with, with James Gunn not being there anymore, and then, you know, we've had three kind of four four and a, three and a half movies at this point well at least one of the cast members has said they're not coming back sure so this is this is probably the end of of this and and that just kind of sucks um but looks like a great movie can't wait to see it and then my last last little bit of news that i just looked up right now i just wanted to see this audience score Again, not that it matters. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't mean that much. It's whatever. Just like IMDb doesn't. Like, you get critic scores for everything, and they just, they're like me. They jump on a soapbox, and they think their opinion matters for a second, and it really doesn't. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, but, yes, the early, very early, because this movie is just coming out today, of course, February uh, 17th, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, notoriously just being thrown through the gutters here on Rotten Tomatoes right now has a critic score of 48%. The audience score right this second is 84%. I do expect that to drop. Of course, people with early, you know, tickets and all that, they're very excited to see the movie. They're going to rate it higher than than people who go, I don't know, probably on Tuesday afternoon or whatever, but I just want a prediction. That's that's all I want. Give me your prediction, Bob. Where do you see the audience score for this settling by next week? By the time we get together next week and have our next episode, where do you think this is going to be? Audience score. Just judging by what it is right now, I'd say hovering around the 80%. Yeah, I was going to say 78. That's what I'm thinking. I don't think that critic score is going to change at all. I mean... It, it, it'll probably go down, if, if anything. If, if <laughs> anything, because, I, I mean... You know, critics, whoever you are, yeah. <laughs> because we don't, we have no idea who these critics, who these so-called experts sure. are. <laughs> but I mean, they definitely don't like comic book movies. You can just tell sure. by looking at the history of critic scores on comic book movies that they really don't like comic book movies. Because I mean, there's always such a big discrepancy between the critic score and the audience score <laughs> for these movies. Yeah, and it's funny that you say that. I want to read just really quick the top quote here from from the top critic at ABC News um, for for this on his Rotten Tomatoes page for uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And Peter Travers says, The once playful runt of the Marvel litter has come down with a case of bloated excess and despite likable Paul Rudd as Ant-Man and a pal villain in Jonathan Majors, the third time is not a charm for a sequel that ignores its own rule. Less is more. So, yeah, what... I, Whatever. <laughs> he, did, he definitely whatever. did not enjoy the movie. Sure. Yeah, I'm thinking... I'm going to go with 78. That's where I'm going to land, and we're going to revisit this next week and see what it, what it ends up as. We're going to take a quick break, and when we do, I'm going to get off my soapbox and... So box <laughs> and we're going to talk about an Archie horror book. Get up. A battle for humanity's future 
is being waged on American soil right now. The cannabis plant has been used by humans for thousands of years, and yet it is still severely criminalized in much of the world. But the world is changing. Yay! In the U.S., 37 states have legalized cannabis for medical purposes, and 18 have done so for recreational use by adults. In Illinois, legalized cannabis has spurred an explosion of new businesses and products, all bringing in a massive stream of newly created revenue that other states are eager to match. Yet federally, cannabis faces much of the same resistance of the 1900s. How did marijuana get such a bad reputation? Why is it still so federally restricted? How are smoking and vaping different? How many edibles are too many? Which companies are coming out with the best new products? And who benefits from keeping Mary Jane in the dark? These are the types of questions we'll attempt to answer on the Cannabis Man podcast. A thorough look at all things cannabis, from its history to its explosion in states that have legalized it. So look out for the Cannabis Man podcast, coming soon wherever you get your podcasts. back to talk about some new books that came out this week in local comic book shops. Of course, The Chilling Adventures of Betty, The Final Girl, issue number one from Archie Comics, the very issue that we're going to be talking about in today's episode dropped this week. We had a new number one from Image Comics, The Last Barbarians, issue number one. Batman, The Adventures Continue, season three, issue number two, with the first appearance of Cassie Kendall, The Old Flame of Bruce Wayne. He has a lot of those. <laughs> We had issue number seven of Eight Billion Genies come out from Image Comics. The penultimate, right? Isn't that yes. what you call a uh, <laughs> second to last? Yes. All right. Sounds cooler that way. The <laughs> penultimate issue of Eight Billion Genies. A great, great series. Really excited to see where that one ends up. A new one shot from Aftershock written by Colin Bunn, Foulness in the Walls. I did pick this and I think the one in 10 or one in 15 incentive up. I flipped through it. Looks interesting. Haven't read it yet. Uh, the solicit for it says that after a tragic loss, a, man's, a man begins to rebuild his life in a new house with a new job and the girl of his dreams. But guilt becomes something as malevolent as an evil spirit. So I don't know what the hell that means, but that's the solicit. We got the new number one from Dark Horse Masters of the Universe, Masterverse, issue number one. Image also put out Torrent number one. We had... Icon versus Hardware number one from DC Comics Milestone imprint, as well as Lazarus Planet Dark Fate, another Lazarus Planet tie-in mm. <laughs> that Bob's very excited about. But look, it does have the first appearance of Chainsaw Nun in it. So if you didn't pick that up, get ready for your Chainsaw Nun cosplay and tattoos because they are coming. Thank God. We had Marvel Tales Avengers End Times number one. A reprint of Avengers 31 through 34, a microverse story that introduces Lord Gazar. Gazar. We also had Marvel Voices Wakanda Forever, Murder World Moon Knight, Nightcrawlers number one, Spider Man number five, Star Wars Bounty Hunters 31. And a second printing on that Scarlet Witch number one, which is a great, great series, by the way. I finally read both those issues back to back, and they are amazing. We also got X-Men 19. And those were some of the books that we wanted to talk about that came out this week. We'll be right back with this time our actual review of Betty the Final Girl. We are back with the all new, all different number one comics podcast. We are going to be talking about the brand new number one book, Chilling Adventures Presents Betty the Final Girl, issue number one, which is just a one shot from Archie Comics, Archie's Horror Imprint. <sighs> that is a mouthful. Yes. This one's an anthology story, which I don't think that I really knew when I picked this out. So we have three different artists and three different writers. So please excuse us this time for not going into our 
deep or surface level dive of the creators like we normally do. But there's just too many here for for us to really go into that without Buy it being a, a long people. thing. Sure. The the first story is B Minor Die, and it's written by Casey Gilly with art by Corolla Borelli, I'm going to say. I hope that's their name. Again, if we say your name incorrectly, please come on the podcast and correct us. We would we would love that. Yes. Followed by Melodies Next, written by Sam Mags and art by Natalie Nardoza. And then we have Rosemary's Babysitter, written by Nicole Astol and art by Laura Braga. That's what I'm going to go with. Ironically enough, it doesn't really credit the, what I'm going to call Crypt Keeper scenes. I don't know what you call those. That's just, you know, from reading Tales from the Crypt and stuff like that. That's what I'm going to call them. You always have that narrated, uh, those scenes that are in between the the smaller stories there. And it doesn't give any credit to the art on those. And it does look like a different, I'm going to assume it's Laura Braga, but it's it's very nice art, whatever it is. And I, I will, I will say as far as what you were talking about, the, um, tale, the tales from the crib style, (laughs) you know, narration, we could have used that in this book. Well, that would have helped. Yeah. it, It seems odd how it's all interwoven and then also interwoven to the movie dreams that Betty's having. I'm, I'm not sure. I, we'll, we'll get into it. But this was confusing, <laughs> to say the least. I'm going to read the synopsis really quick. This was from previews because the Archie synopsis was like, I don't know, 12 paragraphs long. So I'll just go from the preview synopsis. <clears throat> Betty has invite. Sorry. Veronica has invited Betty to her luxurious mountainous chalet for a cozy weekend of skiing but the girls weekend is interrupted when archie shows up and whisk veronica off on their own snowy romantic adventure okay i have no idea what that is in my comic that definitely didn't happen i don't know if it happened in yours but maybe maybe we're missing some interiors and that's why this story didn't quite make sense to us anyways I'll, i'll continue reading what could go wrong at a fancy remote cabin in the mountains all by herself Betty's mind races, and she can't tell fact from fiction as she suddenly realizes she might not be so alone. Is Betty believing too much in the horror movies she's watched, or is someone or something really out to get her? Find out in this brand new horror anthology one-shot that's equal parts Scream and When a Stranger Calls. So, uh, just starting that out right there, what the hell... Are they talking about when did Archie come and <laughs> what? I'm very confused by this. This this is perplexing to me. We didn't see Archie anywhere in the issue. Uh, we don't hear anything about a snowy romantic adventure. I'm not sure why this is in the solicit, but if that is what happened, then then fine. I guess maybe that makes a little more sense as to why Veronica was gone the entire story. Um, the justification that we're given in the book is that she goes out to grab dinner for the girls and, uh, for Leroy, right? Yes. Leroy? Yeah. Yes. So a little confusing, but let's get into the breakdown really quick of, of what we have for the story. And please excuse me for this one. This is a long breakdown. I've written probably four times as much as I normally do. I'm not sure why it happened this way. Maybe because of the lack of dialogue, but it's long. <clears throat> so the book opens with a small interwoven subplot similar to the Crypt Keeper bits from Tales from the Crypt, like I was saying, with Veronica showing Betty her, her quote, family's cozy cabin, which is really like the largest mega mansion ever built in the entire world that I've seen. Um, Elon would be proud. Very. Betty and Veronica's girls weekend is interrupted by the chef and Veronica's little cousin Leroy. And Veronica heads out to go pick up dinner since the chef left, leaving Betty to babysit Leroy by herself. Betty and Leroy sit down to watch a horror movie called Stab Face on Netflix. Betty is left alone while Leroy takes a nap and she puts on the movie, I guess, Be Mine or Die. And here's our first of the three anthology stories, as noted, Be Mine or Die. We're shown a cool heart-shaped box of chocolates with a bunch of exposition 
stating that nine Riverdale residents have been killed, including Bob's all-time favorite, Cheryl Blossom, <laughs> and that each have received a Valentine's Day card depicting the manner in which they're going to be killed in. Bridget walks in to her door holding a card with her name written on it and a heart, and then she calls her friend Maria to let her know she's kind of worried. She sends a pic of the card, and it shows a kitten being bound and tied to a chair that reads, we're all bound, or sorry, <clears throat> that reads, we are bound to be together Valentine. Maria tries to get Bridget to call the police since her parents are still on the cruise and she's home alone. And Bridget sees a figure outside of her window and runs upstairs while calling 911. She grabs a taser and hides under the bed all while texting Maria to let her know what's going on. The killer enters the room and Bridget comes out from under the bed and attacks him with a taser and gets up and he does the same to her. She wakes up, and then she is bound to the chair with a knife to her throat. And then Maria shows up just in time to berate the police. And they also have seemed to just show up right at that moment. They open the door, and then we see Bridget looking pretty unwounded. Like, she looks fine. She's got some blood and stuff on her. But it turns out to be the killer's blood, and he's kind of cut up in the chair. So... Next up, we get the Crypt Keeper part coming back in, and it's a single page, really, of Betty getting up to grab some popcorn. And then there's a small purple envelope thing that's that's shown and kind of zoomed in. It doesn't really give us any reason why, and it never comes up again. And then in the next story, it's called Melody's Next. It is a Josie and the Pussycat story. And Josie and the Pussycats are playing a concert. The lights suddenly go out. They come back on. Three masked arm people show up in the crowd and begin some off-screen carnage. And then <clears throat> the girls go to run off stage to safety. As Melody's running off, she's stopped by a guy with a... Or sorry, she's stopped by one of the attackers with a bear mask. She stabs him through the eye with her drumstick. And after taking him out, a pig mask guy raises his blade to Melody while she's up pushed up against her drum kit, and then she slices his throat with one of her cymbals. She then grabs the blade and kills the last masked man by slicing him through the head. The cops show up, and they're all pointing their guns at Melody. Then we are back to a three-page panel, Crypt Keeper bit, and the final story called Rosemary's Babysit Babysitter. Betty is alone again with a small child, and she receives a text asking her if she's checked on the children. A dead bird shows up against the house's window and she runs upstairs to check on the kid and finds her safe and sound as she walks off and a hand reaches for her from behind. The house's smart system begins announcing that there's an intruder and to check on the children. From behind Betty, we see a cracked door with a bunch of blood on the floor. As Betty looks into the room, there's an arm laying on the floor with blood underneath it and a word balloon asking Betty what's going on. Betty grabs the kid and runs out of the house as a monster follows them. Betty hits the monster with a rock or something, and the kid lets her know that she used the home system to call the police. Sorry if I'm stumbling here, this is very long. <laughs> and Betty tells the girl, good job, and she has to, but then she is interrupted by, this is where it gets very confusing, Veronica waking her up, and we're back to the Crypt Keeper bit. And Betty goes to check on Leroy, and Ver Veronica wonders why Betty left a creepy mask down there. And in the final two panels, after the doorbell rings, Veronica opens it, and it's Betty apologizing for being late, and Veronica worries who's been watching Leroy. So, again, this if you thought my synopsis was all over the place, this book was all over the place. I'm scared that they kind of... Maybe somebody had an idea for two separate books and they stapled them together accidentally and left out some pages. I really have no idea what was going on here. This was a very, very confusing, uh, which I'm sad to say. The Archie horror stuff has been good. It's been really good. Even the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina stuff has been good. The Salem book was great. The Jughead, The Hunger stuff was good. This was very confusing. I think that somebody messed up before it went to print. I'm not sure. Of course, we have that bit in the official synopsis that says that Archie, 
uh, comes in and, and takes Veronica on a romantic ski trip or something, and that didn't really happen here, so maybe something got left out. I'm not sure. They packed way too much into this book. I mean, each each story could have been a book all in its own. Sure, there was a lot packed in and then a lot not paid off as well. I think that the first story worked in a small little horror story itself. But that once we got to the Josie and the Pussycats one, it, it started to fall apart a lot. Um, definitely the last story fell completely apart. And then as I was calling it the Crypt Keeper bit, like really just makes no sense. Um, I'm, I'm very confused by the entire thing. I want to... I want to grade this properly how we normally grade our stuff. It's going to be hard, but uh, but let's let's <clears throat> go ahead and, and talk about the story beats here. Bob, you've got thoughts on the story beats, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I have got thoughts on the story beats. Give them to me. What did you think about the beats of this story? I, gu- I gotta say, I mean, at least for me personally, uh, story beats after the first first anthology or mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it kind of fell apart for me yeah i completely agree once we okay i'm i'm with you where betty and veronica go to the cabin if we want to call it that the the, the mega the structure that Just they're in sure and the and and the story becomes that veronica has to go out to get some food betty's left there with leroy because the chef has left, I'm 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 with you. I'm I'm fine with all that. Mm-hmm. Then they kind of watch a movie. Maybe they kind of maybe maybe we're seeing a, a light dream from Betty or nightmare or whatever, and 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 she sees some of her Riverdale friends you know, being hunted by a serial killer. Okay, I'm fine with that. I'm with you. Once we get to that next crypt, crypt keeper bit, and it's. Betty getting up to get a refill of popcorn, which her popcorn bucket is completely full, so I don't know why, but uh, but that's what she's doing, and, and Leroy's been put to bed for some odd reason, even though she says she's going to wake him up whenever the food gets there. That, that kind of didn't make sense to me. And then, like I said, when I was reading my synopsis, we're shown a close-up of a purple envelope. See, and... Uh, why? <laughs> yeah, I'm... <laughs> what happened? I'm like you, that... That just didn't make sense because they showed the close-up in the panel. But then after that, we're not taken back to that envelope, what it means, what it contains. Sure, there was absolutely no payoff whatsoever. Something fell apart here. I'm not sure what it was. And I'm the only thing I can think of was maybe they meant for it to be a relic of that story. So That's maybe it, it was Betty's own Valentine from the serial killer, and it just was never realized because we're supposed to, as the synopsis read, Betty can't tell reality from from the fantasy that's in her movie dreams or, or, or whatever. Okay, I'm okay with that, but I do feel like there should have at least been a callback to it. Something, I'm a little confused by it. There wasn't enough emphasis put on anything there. Um, and, and that's what I'm talking about with the story beats here that didn't make enough sense. And then aside from that, we go into that next story. We go into the Josie and the Pussycats one. It, it's not that I have a problem with the story itself, but it's so small and it's so kind of self-contained and this just little glimpse of, of what happened at the at the at the concert there to me and i don't know how you felt about this entire comic but to me it just felt like they they basically you pulled from various horror movies because especially especially with veronica's place you know i got i got a lot of the shining vibe Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um from you know, the the guys in the animal mask, you mm-hmm. know, personally, I got a lot of, and correct me if I'm wrong, if there's another movie that does the same thing, but I got a lot of The Purge. Yeah, with The Purge. With the people in the animal masks. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, you know, uh, what was it? The, um, the first one um, with Bridget. Mm-hmm. I actually got a lot of, like, the opening scene of Scream. Yeah, definitely. 
So, again, it just feels like this comic was all over the place. They, I mean... I know anthology series, you know, they don't follow the traditional A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. you know, route because it is an anthology and they're telling different stories. But, I mean, yes, and I guess you could say the stories were interconnected by the fact that they were, they were lucid dreams, mm -hmm. I guess you would say, but I don't know, to me... Nothing really, you know, tied together. And then you had the M. Night Shyamalan-esque <laughs> twist at the end. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, it's kind of like they never addressed that throughout the comic. Or any, you know, suspicions about that throughout the comic. And then all of a sudden, okay, it wasn't petty. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I don't get here. I, I don't think that everything was, was quite realized or... I'm just not sure what we are supposed to assume. If it's not Betty, then who is it? I'm fine with things being left open to imagination or interpretation or whatever, but... If done well. Yeah, but you're telling me that Veronica's best friend, you know, Betty's best friend, Veronica, can't tell the difference between <laughs> Veronica and, I mean, uh, who, who is it then? We're not seeing anything supernatural in this book, so I, I can't assume it's like an alien or shapeshifter or something. See, and the, the, pro the problem, you know, and they use that kind of trope in movies and TV series, if they're doing like a cliffhanger or mm -hmm. whatever. If set up well, then it works. If not set up well, and you don't explain anything or give clues throughout the entire thing, mm -hmm. it just falls flat because the reader is left like, the reader or viewer is left like, what happened and why am I supposed to care? Yeah, exactly. I think there would have been a really easy way around this. You definitely could have had the interwoven Crypt Keeper bits with Look, you could have even started it that way. Veronica had to leave to pick up dinner. Let's say maybe she accidentally leaves her phone there or something. So then whenever she comes back with dinner, the door's locked. She can't get in. She doesn't have her phone to call. So maybe she's like banging on the door and stuff like that. And then Betty gets scared and we're seeing like little clips of Betty, you know, hiding from the windows and stuff like that. And she's thinking a killer's after her and that's how you tie it all in or something. Would have been like really easy to do and explain other than she just leaves for some something that seems like a really, really long amount of time for, for no reason whatsoever and and then comes back and there's a replacement there. I, it just didn't make any sense. And then you're telling me that Betty's like hours and hours late, but she never calls Veronica to tell her she's running late or anything. And then it, it just, I'm not sure what this implies. But anyways... Yeah, the beats are all over the place. It's, it's very confusing. The narrative is, is... I don't even know that we could rate the narrative here. I don't see any opportunity to rate it other than kind of to repeat what we just said. Um, the dialogue, I feel, is okay enough where it's used correctly, but it falls apart in, in certain aspects too. When the whole thing falls apart, it doesn't work. It's really kind of hard to talk about the dialogue. I think that once we get into that first story with Bridget and Maria, their dialogue works fine. The characters are talking to one another. Bridget's dialogue with the killer, which is, you know, few and far between, of course, but, uh, but that all works. It's kind of once we get into the interwoven plot in between that, that it really falls apart. The world building... Again, like this whole thing is kind of falling apart, so I have to blame a little bit of the world building too. I don't think that they really fleshed out anything here. We're shown the cabin that the girls are in, and that's a nice little world or whatever, but it's outside of Riverdale where a lot of these stories are taking place in. Um, the Riverdale stuff seems like Riverdale, I guess. We're not shown like a lot of throwbacks to anything landmarky in Riverdale, but but it's there. Um, this, this story was confusing and hard to, to get through. <laughs> I will give it that. Uh, maybe we get into the art. I think the character designs were, were great here. This is some really good art. Each 
again, each story has a different artist as it does a different writer. It all worked well together, though. The styles didn't seem too different from one another to not gel with, with each other, in my opinion. And they were really good art. I know Laura Braga off the top of my head. She's a wonderful artist, of course. Um, I don't know, Bob, you have any thoughts on the art of the characters? Of, of... I, can't, I can't really necessarily say anything about the um, art one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've never read an Archie book. You know, Archie comics, anything like that. The only never, wow. The only thing I have to go off of is you know, <laughs> like the daily newspaper. Okay. You know, funnies. So, but I mean, what I've seen from you know Archie books, I mean, the art, you know, lines up with, you know, what I've seen from that, and I guess you know, since they were going from for a horror element i mean as when you're trying to do a book with like a horror element i mm-hmm. mean you don't want that you know um i guess i could i, I guess they compare it to somebody like uh alex ross or steve mcniven that kind of sure. that kind of perfect photorealistic you know art mm-hmm. i mean you want kind of like a um i don't want to say jagged edge but kind of a little bit, not totally photorealistic, but like a rougher, like uh, with a few rougher edges. I yeah, mean, sure. I can't say that correctly. A little gritty or yeah. whatever, yeah. Um, I will say this. Ever since, I can't remember what year it was. I'm going to go out on a limb and say 2015. I could be completely wrong. So could back in right the day. Right. Sure. Um, but, but I could be completely wrong about that year. But ever since Archie was rebooted kind of to the all-new Archie number one, and Mark Wade kind of took over the storytelling and everything. Um, Archie art has been phenomenal. I've never seen anything from Archie since that reboot that was not amazing. Every Archie book I pick up is beautiful. They look really, really good, uh, drawn very, very well. Some interesting stories in the Archie universe too, but yeah, the Archie stuff outside of that house style Dan Parent thing has been very, very interesting as of the creation of like the all new Archie number one. So everything in that universe and this, this is gorgeous artwork. This, the characters look really, really good here. I really liked the depictions of, of the girls and, and, and everything in this, they did a wonderful job. The locations look great. We talked about that cabin. It looks amazing. Um, that the backgrounds there. And then as well as, I think to that last, that, that final story, which I, uh, Rosemary's babysitter. Um, and we get the, that huge house that's kind of in the woods there with all the glass and everything. It looks, looks wonderful. Some really great locations and backgrounds and the colors really work well with all of that. So, so I think to break this one down in our traditional sense, it's going to be very, very hard, but but just to say, you know, at least my thoughts and opinions so far are that the story really falls flat and does not work at all, and the art is amazing. Um, I, and I agree totally. The art is definitely the best thing about this book. Yeah, so I, I feel bad that this is the book we're covering, but this is the book we're covering. We wanted to get an Archie in there, so, so we did. I'm sad that this is the one that we got because it is not narratively a good story at all. But and it doesn't even it doesn't even <clears throat> gel with the previews that it was talking about. That, yeah, that's the confusing part. Sure, something something fell apart here. Just not sure what it is, but something did horribly fall apart here. But yeah, this was this was a book. Um, <laughs> I'm I can't lie. I'm glad that it's a one shot. I'm glad we're not doing anything else with this. The other Chilling Adventures stuff in the Archie universe have have really worked. The Sabrina stuff is great. The one shot with Salem was good. Um, It's just this fell flat and it didn't work. We don't have to ask to ask the question if we'll continue on to the second issue because this was a one shot. And I think that, as we said, Bob and I would (laughs) probably not be continuing the second Mm, issue if this were an ongoing... So I think we're pretty safe to say maybe stay away from this one, guys. Unless you just want to look at some nice artwork, 
if you want to read a cohesive story that <laughs> that makes sense or you're not wasting 15 minutes of your life, probably probably stay away from this one. Feel bad saying that, and I was hoping that this would be a good book, but it just wasn't. So uh, not every book is gonna be a home run, though. Sure, sure. With that being said, that very disappointing review we had to give there of Chilling Adventures presents Betty the Final Girl Number One. We'll be right back. After this is Labyrinth your favorite movie? Do you like Full House Easter eggs? How about movie-themed brackets for best movie props? I'm Dan. And I'm Jer, and we love breaking down movies to discuss their impacts in pop culture. Best scenes, favorite characters, and how these movies age. Tune into our growing selection of movies wherever you find podcasts by searching Real Good Movies. That's real with two E's. Here are our thoughts on everything from Iron Man to Phone Booth, Halloween to Planet of the Apes. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and subscribe for future episodes. Now, what do we rate that trailer out of 10? One. That's definitely a one. We are back after that chilling, chilling review of Chilling Adventures Presents <laughs> Betty the Final Girl. That was the cheesiest thing. Rimshot, please. With, so, yeah, I had to do it. We're going to be talking about a few books that come out next week in your comic book shops. Bob thought he would compile a list so you could call, email, snail mail, walk over to, do whatever you do at your local comic book shops to make sure that you have your books added to your pool. Does anybody use actual mail anymore? Um, probably like someone's grandma to send them like a $5 card <laughs> or something for their birthday, I would assume. Fair enough. Yeah, why not? Bob, what do we got coming out next week? So, from Dark Horse, we have Star Wars The High Republic Adventures, The Nameless Terror Number 1. Okay. The High Republic... A is spinoff. Nice. The High Republic <laughs> has had a lot of spinoffs. Sure. From Titan, we have Moriarty, Clockwork Empire Number 1, being the Sherlock Holmes... Moriarty, so this will be a Sherlock Holmes series. Oh, good. I was wondering what the hell that meant. So, okay, cool. <laughs> kind of looking forward to that. Glad one. you were there to explain it. <laughs> From Red Five, we have Fallen Number One. Not exactly familiar with Red Five. It's a small publisher, but they put out some cool stuff. Um, from, I guess it's Frank Miller's imprint. Frank Miller presents mm -hmm. Ancient Enemies. The and correct me if I'm wrong in this name, the Ginny number one. We'll go with that because we all know that you can pronounce things better than me. So I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing it's the Ginny. <laughs> From Image Comics, we have Local Man number one. Sounds fun and uninteresting. From Vault, we have Godfell number one. From Dark Horse, we have Blue Book number one, which I have to say this sounds like it harkens back to the X Files TV series. Yeah, that's it. Looks cool. the The cover looks great on this one. I'm pretty excited about it. it looks like the a fun the, book. the cover definitely has that Steven Spielberg <laughs> Close Encounters kind of vibe. Oh yeah, looks cool. Um, from <laughs> From Marvel, we have another facsimile. We have Amazing Spider-Man number 129. So if you can't afford the first appearance <laughs> of the Punisher, this is a good way to get the first appearance of the Punisher and read it. Well, the sad thing is you can't afford an ASM 129. As we all know, <clears throat> the Golden Age record reprints Sure, you are... Can't. This is, I think, the second time. I believe last year Marvel put this same facsimile out. So this is the second time they're doing this same facsimile, oh, okay. which is interesting. Um, this is not the first time they've done this, I don't think. I remember, shit, I have a Lionsgate film, uh, ASM 129. Oh, with I, the, forgot about the, <laughs> yeah. I forgot about the Lionsgate. Given out at the, uh, yeah, at the Punisher movie. I but, forgot about that. Yeah, uh, they exist. But I digress on that. From Marvel Comics, we have Punisher War Journal base number one, mm. which is basically a one-shot which gives the origin of the War Journal. 
Okay. Tiger Division number four. Not exactly familiar with Tiger Division myself. Okay, Tiger Division's been out for a couple of issues now. They're um, they're like a Asian team. So they're basically like Big Hero Six. Not so much, but I, I, maybe on the surface, sure. Okay. <laughs> From DC, we have Catwoman number 52. Uh, another facsimile uh, comic from Fawcett, Wiz Comics number 2, with Captain Marvel on the cover. So again, if you can't afford Wiz Comics number 2, <laughs> then you can at least afford the facsimile edition. And who can't afford that? Come on. Uh, we have another, from DC, we have another One Bad Day, Clayface number 1, under the <laughs> Batman... <laughs> One Bad Day storyline. You know, I wouldn't be interested in this one if it hadn't been for watching that Harley Quinn uh, <laughs> Valentine special. <laughs> now Where he falls in love with himself. <laughs> now maybe I'll check it. From DC, we have the Lazarus Planet Omega number one, the Lazarus Planet event finale. Dan, I don't know about you, <laughs> but this storyline... Which, it hasn't been that long, but it feels like it's been going on for years. Yeah, it's it's hard with the one-shots. With the every week a number one in the planet, or Lazarus Planet uh, event there, I think that that was, I don't know, I, I think that that's just a little too much. I think DC could have just made a, a main series. I know I've said it on here before. Could have just done a main series and and had it numbered how it was, 1 through 12 or whatever. But yeah, these one-shots made it seem incredibly long. Yes. From Marvel Comics, we have a Sins of Sinister event tie-in, Immortal X-Men number one. All right, Immortal X-Men is back with a new volume. Love it. From Bad Kids Press, we have the Nowhere Man number one in... This definitely sounds like an interesting comic. I'll, I'll read the synopsis according to uh, Key Collector. A man is trapped in a spirit world of the subconscious where he encounters gods, shamans, and other strange, unexpected creatures. So it definitely sounds like it's going to be my trip. Oh yeah, sounds, sounds like a good time to be had. <laughs> and finally from Marvel Comics, we have Betsy Braddock... Braddock... Captain Britain number one. A book that everyone has been asking for for years. Thank God it's finally coming to fruition. Those are some books that are coming out next week. A few exciting books. A few not so much. Make sure you get a hold of your local comic book shop so you can reserve those. Make sure you mail that letter. <laughs> mail it in. Get your copies. You hear it. Heard it here first, folks. <laughs> wow. We're going to talk about the book that we're covering next week really quick. Bob, what are we talking about next week? Uh, from DC, we're talking about Superman number one. This is actually... I don't know how many more times we'll be able to talk <laughs> about a Superman number one issue. They don't come around that often. Sure. Maybe a... Not once in a lifetime, but once in a long time opportunity. So, yeah, something we're definitely going to hop on. We want to talk about Superman number one. Make sure you guys pick up your copy so you can follow along with us. And we're going to close this thing out. Please make sure you check us out on social media. We're on Instagram at ANAD underscore number one. That's the number one comics podcast. We're on Twitter at ANAD comic pod. TikTok, A-N-A-D, number one comics pod. And you can check us out on YouTube under the comic book channel. Each and every week, as Bob and I review our book, we also like to do a free giveaway, free to you, the listener, free of postage and everything. Your comic will be in near mint condition, bagged and boarded. All you have to do is use the hashtag all new, all different nation on your social media of choice, and we would be happy to get that book out to you. Of course, this week, you'll be receiving a copy of the beautifully illustrated Chilling Adventures Presents Betty, the Final Girl, number one from Archie's Horror Imprint. Guys, that's it. Thank you so much for checking out the show. Until next time. <laughs>
Batman, but uh, I'm Batman, but uh, I'm Batman, but uh, I'm Batman, but uh, I'm Batman, but uh.